Hello, I'm Dr. Jay Noreen. Welcome to Health Talk. You know, we're seeing lots of advertisements, TV ads, for example, for new medications for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it's, it's quite common, seems to be increasing. The question is, what is rheumatoid arthritis? Well, we're fortunate today to hear from Dr. Martina Ziegenbein of Appalachian Regional Internal Medicine Specialists. She's here today to give us answers to a lot of the questions uh, those of us out there have about rheumatoid arthritis and related problems in healthcare. Uh, Dr. Ziegenbein, thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Well, we'd uh, be delighted if you could tell us a little bit about your specialty, rheumatology. And, you know, I think people out there would be very pleased to hear something about how did you get into medicine? How did you get into medicine in the first place? There are students out there who are thinking about it, and they'd be delighted to hear a I bit see. from you. So in my case, I always was, I have always been interested in science. I remember in high school, I was doing a project on how high heels affect women, how it's not good for their feet. And it was just fascinating. It was explaining about muscles of the calves and the heel and the foot. So I have always been drawn to science. And for some reason, I have always known I wanted to go into medicine. So it's, uh, it was kind of a natural choice for me. Uh -huh. So um, I finished my medical school in Slovakia, in um, Šafarik University Medical School in Košice, which is Eastern Slovakia. And Slovakia is Central Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And then I came to the United States in 2001 to pursue internal medicine residency in uh, Marshfield, Wisconsin, actually, with Marshall Clinic. And then I went on to do a rheumatology fellowship, uh, both at, uh, or first at Boston University Medical Center, and that at Johns Hopkins Medical School, where I did my lupus fellowship to get some more experience with lupus. Lupus being a disease that uh, rheumatologists deal with uh, with some frequency and is very complicated. Well, you have a you have a training record that's very impressive. Johns Hopkins and, and Wisconsin and Boston University are very prominent places. Now I'm biased because I was at Wisconsin for a long time, so I'm right. delighted to hear that. Uh, can you say a little more about the specialty of rheumatology? Of course. So um, rheumatology is a medical, which means non-surgical uh, subspecialty in internal medicine that deals with illnesses of, um, that deals with rheumatic illnesses. And a rheumatic illness is uh, basically any illness that uh, can affect musculoskeletal system, which is muscles, joints, and bones. And one of the most famous representatives in that regard is rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, rheumatic illness also can be an illness that uh, affects connective tissue or immune system. And, in, and immune illnesses or immune system illnesses are referred to as autoimmune illnesses. And rheumatoid arthritis is actually rep representative of that also. It's uh, one of the most famous autoimmune uh, musculoskeletal diseases. All right, thank you, thank you, that's very helpful. Well, we're going to focus today principally on rheumatoid arthritis, it being okay. as uh, serious an, an illness as uh, many of us have family members or friends who have experienced it. So we're going to focus mostly on that today but uh, I know there are a wide range of things you deal with in your practice beyond that. But right. That'll be the focus today. So can we start with uh, just a bit of a description about what is rheumatoid arthritis? And if you could make a bit of a distinction with osteoarthritis. Of course. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis is um, an autoimmune illness, and that means that the immune system of our own body, which is meant to fight infections or foreign bodies, it's activated and starts attacking uh, our own body, specifically in its mostly joints. It causes swelling, redness, warmth. Um, it can progress to significant disability if nothing is done. And I said mostly it affects joints, but rheumatoid arthritis uh, patients can uh, be affected, um, can have other organs affected, such as lungs or skin. Uh, or I, but most famous manifestation uh, in rheumatoid arthritis is joint inflammation. Mm -hmm. So patients present usually with joint pain. Joint pain, swelling, stiffness, discomfort that is worse in the morning, gets slightly better with activity, uh, and uh, gets worse again after any dormancy or when people are not active. So usually with, n during the night, uh, people get up feeling extremely stiff. Now, osteoarthritis um, is similar only in the sense that it also affects joints. The layman term for osteoarthritis is wear and tear disease. Uh -huh. Rheumatologists don't like, uh, or scientists who study osteoarthritis don't like 
other people are referring to this wear and tear because it's not really that simple. It's not just wear and tear. Uh, osteoarthritis has less inflammation. There is some, but it's much less, and it doesn't cause uh, systemic symmetric symptoms like rheumatoid arthritis does. Uh, osteoarthritis can be very uh, prominent um, in knee, for example, in knees or hips. Uh, there are subsets of osteoarthritis. So, for example, a research has found that when a mother has a hand osteoarthritis, all women down the line uh, would have also hand osteoarthritis. It's mm. genetic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, um, that would so, be kind of. So, osteoarthritis is not in the same category of what you call an autoimmune disease no, as rheumatoid arthritis, it, which it, is our own body reacting against uh, itself. Correct. Yeah. That's a very okay, good well summary. Okay, that's, that's a distinction that I think a lot of people don't understand, and that's, that's very helpful. Uh, can you give a sense of how common rheumatoid arthritis is? So, uh, currently, it's estimated that about 40 million, 40 to 45 million of Americans uh, suffer, so it's um, not uh, that common in the big scheme of things, but it's the most common of the autoimmune rheumatic illnesses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, That's still a substantial number. Correct, because it's um, most general rheumatologists, so like me, my colleague, Dr. Logan, uh, those of us who see the bread and butter rheumatology, most of our practice is comprised of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. anywhere from 60 to 80 percent, really. Oh, that much of your practice mm -hmm. is rheumatoid arthritis? Correct. Wow, that is a big number, yeah. What, uh, what is it that causes rheumatoid arthritis? Do we know? Well, a lot is already known. Uh, we know that there is a gene that people inherit, but the gene by itself is not enough. There, something has to happen in the environment, uh, and something has to happen in the patient's body f to create so-called perfect storm to allow for that inflammation to start. And um, there is a lot of talk about microbiome, meaning the gut uh, bacteria contributing to the inflammation. The details are not known yet, um, or not enough for us to affect uh, our daily practice, mm -hmm. but it's really exciting uh, time to uh, follow the news and updates on rheumatoid arthritis because uh, it's very promising for treatments that are coming soon. So microbiome, let's talk about that because I think this is in the news a bit recently, microbiomes. Right. In, in, in essence, that's the bacteria that live in a human body? Is that what that is? Right. Or, uh -huh. So there are billions of bacteria uh, of, in every human, and a big part of those are, live in our gastrointestinal system, in our gut. And um, the, it's believed that the inflammation can start after the microclimate of these bacteria is affected. So it's through what we eat, of course, but it's also through different environments um, we live. It's through stress. We don't exactly know all the details, but that's why there are many proponents of uh, clean diets that eliminate processed foods, that el eliminate sugar, uh, in order to um, literally clean up uh, the environment, our gut environment, to see what it makes change. I have to say, though, there is currently not enough evidence to promote just one particular diet in rheumatology for rheumatoid arthritis, and there is still a role for medications. And what, however, many rheumatologists, including myself, try to um, relate to patients when we treat them is that uh, let's start with the medicine. You already have the inflammation. Let's start with medication. And let's also start changing your diet, your lifestyle, so that uh, once we get you in remission, we can keep you there with as little or as few medications as possible, mm -hmm. and uh, potentially even down the road, none. Mm -hmm. But right now, just diet change alone is not the answer. So medication is critical to rheumatoid arthritis Right now, treatment. still. Correct. Well, we'll come back to that and talk mm -hmm. a little more, but uh, a question a bit before that. How is it diagnosed? So if I have joint pains and I come to you, 
how do I how do I get the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis? That is an excellent question. Thank you. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis is still a clinical diagnosis, and what that means is that the testing that we blood testing is only used to support the diagnosis, but the diagnosis still comes from taking the history and getting uh, co basically collecting data from history. The patient gives me the uh, all the symptoms they have, and then supplementing it with the exam. So I examine the person, I look at their joints, I feel them, I touch them, I look at them, and of course I examine the rest of the body, but swelling and inflammation of the joints on exam is the main part of the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, there are cases, situations when you do need to do blood tests or rule out other diseases because a rheumatoid arthritis um, or what appears to be rheumatoid arthritis may be another condition. Uh -huh. It just masks as rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So that's why the tests are still important uh -huh. in many cases. Uh -huh. um, to give you an example, um, a patient with celiac disease. So mm -hmm. celiac disease is gluten, uh, is allergy to gluten. Mm -hmm. When the gut gets attacked by immune system after people eat grains or bread, and that can present as joint inflammation and very often also with skin findings, with mm -hmm. rash, but you do want to make sure you don't um, diagnose someone with rheumatoid arthritis until you're sure. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other clues usually in the history that point you to that direction. So there's been a lot of uh, publicity about gluten-free diets recently, and right. I, I understand that there are a very small number of people that have a problem with, with, uh, with the gluten. But if, if I do have joint pain and, and, and I want to get, get evaluated, uh, what, what, what would make me say, yes, it's enough that I really should come and see you? And wh where do people first get the manifestation? What are they, what's their first experience when they say, gee, I think I better get this checked out? If, what, if they have rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. you mean? It's usually joints. I mean, uh, rheumatoid arthritis usually present with joints. Hands or, or well, what's most common? Or most is there not com a... I see, I see. Uh, so it's mostly uh, small and medium-sized joints. So okay. small joints, meaning the knuckles of the fingers, the wrists, uh, knuckles of the... Uh, feet, um, mm -hmm. the uh, the middle of the foot joints, ankles, but uh, rheumatoid arthritis can affect um, larger joints like elbow, shoulders, knees. The key feature though, however, is that usually it's symmetric, um, meaning it affects both sides equally. Okay. Unlike psoriatic arthritis, which can be on, in only one or two joints and ah, it's okay. for a long time, so it's, and it's asymmetric. So it can be an ankle and a knee or ankle and a wrist in psoriatic arthritis. But uh, the clue, so it's symmetric. It starts, uh, it very commonly affects hands, wrists, uh, ankles, feet. And it, it goes on for quite, you know, several weeks. And people just are really feeling miserable in the morning. They have stiffness, they have trouble opening or using their hands. And uh, it goes on day after day after day. And uh, they feel better during the day. And then the drama and misery starts over in the morning. So uh -huh. a lot of stiffness, pain in the morning usually is an indicator, If in multiple joints usually is an indicator that something is going on. Mm -hmm. So in the morning, stiffness and pain, but also both sides, both hands or both is a common characteristic. Usually, but you know, to be honest, if, I ha if a patient comes with uh, unilateral, meaning swelling and pain and stiffness in only one extremity, it's still relevant. Yeah. So we still, but yeah. it probably is another condition. Yes, okay, very very interesting. What about treatment? What's what's the what's the treatment plan that most people experience? So, uh, and I want to point out at this point that this is one of the reasons it's so exciting to be a rheumatologist because we have so many new treatments that mm -hmm. were not available 20, 30 years, and not even 15 years ago, some of these treatments. And very rarely now we see debilitating disease when patients become disfigured or their joints are so deformed that they cannot perform, they cannot work. So in many cases, this is the thing of the past. Patients in the past, in 1960s, 70s, 80s, would develop severe disease when they when would they develop severe deformities and disability. No longer is rheumatoid arthritis uh, like a sentence to disability, and that's one of the reasons it's exciting to be a rheumatologist. Um, so mesotrexate is still 
the standard of care. Mm -hmm. Methotrexate is extremely old medication. It's uh, used both in chemotherapy and in much lower dosages in rheumatology. But many times it's not enough. Uh, so we have uh, quite a big group of medications available that can be added to methotrexate. Uh, and that's probably what you're referring to that you see a lot of on TV, the ads. Yes, yes. They are referred to as biologic medications. And the, the um, beauty and benefit of them is that they are targeted against one particular uh, component of the inflammation cascade that is that makes it very effective when you block it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's the new the new medications that are, but still methotrexate or, is the standard of care, correct? Mm -hmm. And it's then I for should a long mention time. correct, and I think it's going to remain right. And mm -hmm. I should mention steroids. We use steroids a lot mm -hmm. in um, rheumatology. Steroid is a hormone that is produced by our own adrenal glands, but people with inflammation need much more of it, so we deliver it in form of out pill steroid. Mm -hmm. And uh, many rheumatologists have love and hate relationship with steroids because they are so helpful, but they can cause so many side effects, so we try to use them for a very short time. Mm -hmm. So people out there with rheumatoid arthritis, probably s several of them would have experienced steroid treatment at some point in time. Correct. Uh, and those side effects, uh, can you say a, just kind of a summary of what kind of side effects that of those people might experience from steroids? Well, the, we divide them into two groups. The first, the first one are immediate or short. When we use, when we start using the steroids, that, uh, side effects that can happen right away. So that smooth changes. Uh, people can become irritable, may have difficulty sleeping, they can have upset stomach, um, um, fast heartbeat, and they get, they feel hungry almost all the time, uh -huh. or many people report that. So that's short-term side effects. Uh -huh. Long-term side effects are those that people develop as a result of long-term use, and some patients need to be on steroids for a long time. And those we worry about more because they are harder to reverse, but that's weight gain, um, increased risk of diabetes, uh, steroids can lead to elevated blood pressure, and some of the things we worry most about is um, weakening of the bones or bone thinning or osteoporosis. Uh -huh. And that's a big, a truly big risk, especially uh, in patients who stay on steroids for a long time. So that would be lupus patients. Lupus patients in particular, especially the most severe cases uh, when their kidneys or lungs are involved, they stay on steroids for a long time, sometimes years, and that leads to risk of bone thinning. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the kind of the hard things to deal with in rheumatology, but mm -hmm. we, we can go into detail. Yes, and osteoporosis is more common in women. Correct. Uh, and so is I, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, is it more common in men or women? So uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear, rheumatoid arthritis is more common in women, um, and osteoporosis also, but only until, so postmenopausal women um, have accelerated bone loss. Um, but eventually that evens out with men after 70, 75. So okay. men after 75 should be screened for osteoporosis also, whether they have rheumatoid arthritis or other illnesses or not. Okay, okay, okay. You know, you, you were mentioning the, the uh, uh, joint distortion that has happened in the past with rheumatoid arthritis. And, uh, you know, I think probably many of us can remember a grandmother who had rheumatoid arthritis and had very gnarly joints and things Correct. like that. But that's interesting what you said, that that's not as common because the treatment has been so much more effective. But I bet there are a lot of people out there who remember grandma who had, you know, very uh, hands that were quite unusual because of having Correct. that. So it's quite, I, a lot of people are familiar with that, I and, expect. And you know, and you still see it. I, it's not to say that you, you never see it. I mean, I still have patients who, there is still that small proportion of patients uh, with the most severe arthritis that don't respond to anything or to very little and they require steroids and by the time you get them on effective treatment, they have developed deformities. Or I have seen patients who uh, have developed rheumatoid arthritis in the 1990s and they did not have access to the uh, effective treatment right away. And uh -huh. by the time they got to me, and we did them, I did start them on appropriate treatment, but by the time they have developed deformities. But th that's another aspect of rheumatology. You are so humbled when you, when you meet these patients and you realize how they were able to get accustomed to their limitations and deformities yeah, yes. and, and how much they persevere and 
Yeah. Um, but anyways, I meant to say you still see the deformities, but it's just that when you uh, diagnose someone de novo, when you give them a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, you no longer have to say, well, you'll be in a wheelchair in 10 years. Yes. That, that is no longer. Yes, and that used know, the, to be the case uh, exactly, year, years ago. Exactly, in many patients, right. Yeah, yeah. And so early treatment is probably important in that case then, right? Correct, absolutely. And many, the more and more studies are coming out, they, pro, uh, they promote treatment as early as in the first three months, you oh. know, after diagnosis. Like, you want to get them on aggressive treatment um, so that, because many, uh, bone changes, uh, meaning bone erosions, that's when inflammation occurs for a long time, it can actually eat up uh, the edges of the bone of the joint. So that happens in the, early, in the severe cases, it happens early in the disease. So you want to start them as early as you can. As within three months of development of symptoms, you want to have them on the treatment, and that's still an issue sometimes. This is an important message to the, to the people uh, watching and listening, and that is if you are having early morning stiffness, if you're having joint pain, See, uh, see your rheumatologist or your, your internist soon Correct. because it maybe you do have rheumatoid arthritis and you should get treatment started pretty Absolutely. soon. Absolutely. So that's a very, very important message, very important message. Good, good. Well, one other thing I wonder about is what is the typical onset? What, what age do people generally, what's the, what's the likelihood that people will begin having, or at what age does it typically happen? That's a good question also. So there are actually two waves, so to speak. Uh, early, young adults develop uh, rheumatoid arthritis, so between the ages of 15 to, 20, to 30. And then the, another wave is um, between 45 to 65, so middle age onset. And then less frequent, but we still have elderly onset, so people after 65 uh, mm -hmm. develop. But, so there are two waves, younger and middle age adults. Okay, okay. Now, there is something called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. What, what, what is that exactly? Can you describe that? Uh, so uh, I do have to say I don't treat uh, kids. Yes, I, I understand. But juvenile rheumatoid arthritis is uh, autoimmune uh, joint inflammation that occurs in pediatrics, basically in children, uh, as early as two or six weeks old. Oh, it really? can happen. There are there are three main categories, and uh, it's um, it's believed to be a subgroup of the the umbrelling. Um, group of inflammatory joint diseases, and uh, there are treatments that are effective, and patients um, or kids, I should say, children can have normal lives, and you would never know that they do have juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis patients then become adult patients of adult rheumatologists, and their disease still needs to be controlled, and they need to have a regular follow-up. Um, so. Now, once a person is diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, I'm not talking about juvenile now, but adults, is it a given that that's going to go on forever? Does it sometimes go away, or what, what, what's its life history? Is it predictable? You ask good questions. <laughs> uh, so w short answer is we don't know, but um, we try to, uh, or the goal of treatment, the reason we give people treatment is to bring them into remission. Mm -hmm. So remission means they are free of symptoms, they wake up in the morning and they don't know that they have a disease. They, the only reason they know they have a disease is because they have to take the medication. Yeah. So that's a remission, uh, basically no swollen, tender, red, hot joints. Right now, we don't know whether and uh, when it's okay to stop the treatment. Mm -hmm. And there are studies underway. There are always new data coming on, um, coming out. Many patients do this experiment for us, meaning they that, stop taking right, <laughs> and that's how we. And there are patients who, uh, let's say, they are on treatment for two years, then they stop it, and they're fine for five years, and then they have a first flare in five years. Okay. That's why. There are many rheumatologists, me including, who always believe that once the patient has been in remission for at least a year without any steroids, it's okay to try to start tapering the treatment mm -hmm. and bring them basically into either minimal methotrexate dose or when patients prefer none, then we go to none and let's, let's see. But there are many patients who already tried it. They tried to taper and stop and they flared and then they decide, no, we, we don't know why I was okay for five years uh -huh. and I flared and then they just basically decide, let's try to figure out what is the minimum effective dose and let's stay on that yeah, yeah. forever. Interesting, interesting. Now, you, you mentioned, and it's characteristic, that people start out in the morning with stiffness, 
but over time it gets better during the day. So is exercise a factor in, in how to try to deal with rheumatoid arthritis? So that's also a very good question because we always encourage patients um, once they are an effective treatment uh, to return to some level of kinetic activity that used to be part of their life or if it wasn't, we, we try to uh, convince patients to make exercise part of their uh, kinetic, uh, part of their lifestyle because Exercise promotes um, good feelings, they, it promotes a fitness uh, and endurance, and uh, unless it's combat or unless it's a uh, high impact sport, it's usually protective for joints. Okay. So yes, we do encourage patients. We don't just treat people though with exercise. Right now, it's not a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, but there are many conditions, musculoskeletal conditions, when exercise is the main treatment. Yeah, but for rheumatoid arthritis, medication is essential. But some exercise Whatever can the patient can tolerate, absolutely. The, the and I'm a big, big proponent of that, yeah, yes. Yeah. Great. Well, this is, this is very interesting and very, very instructive. We really appreciate your, your spending time with us, Dr. Ziegenbein. And I know there are a lot of other topics that we could discuss. Uh, we don't have enough time to do so, but we, we hope you'll come back for of another course. time and we can talk about some of the things we touched on fairly briefly. But it's delightful to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, that's our program for this week. If you have questions or comments, you can contact us at watchapptv.com. And please join us throughout the week for Health Talk. I'm Dr. Jay Noreen.